That music was used every week for Orson Welles and his Mercury Theater on CBS. And during Halloween in 1938, they did a radio adaptation of just another book in their series, one by H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds. And Orson Welles wasn't even 24 years old yet. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. And Wells continued, reading the words of writer Howard Koch, who crafted some of the most brilliant prose ever heard on radio. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Then a weather report is heard, and then music from a hotel. It's interrupted by a bulletin that something has hit the ground near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. At the same time, there are reports of some type of gaseous disturbances on Mars. The network sends reporter Carl Phillips to the observatory at Princeton to talk to Professor Pearson, who is also played by Orson Welles. Professor Pearson. Could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Oh, hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Then everything's okay for a while. More music, more regular radio reports... But a lot of people had been listening to the top show of the evening, Edgar Bergen, and they didn't like what they heard. The comedy wasn't that funny. The singer who was on the show, Nelson Eddy, was having a bad night. So they twisted the dial and ended up listening to the War of the Worlds after it had started, after they were told it was a radio drama, just about the time the network switched to Grover's Mill, New Jersey, where something was happening to that thing that crashed there. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmoth Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tub. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal, kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. It's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. Eventually, Carl Phillips is on the air again. And he gets caught up in what's happening. A shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires, the, the gas tanks, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. At this point, there is the first of several long, quiet pauses for effect. And before we find out what happened to reporter Phillips, there are reports coming in from Washington, including one from a government official who sounds a lot like FDR. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. Then the network announcer is back with the news no one wanted to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Eventually, the network begins broadcasting from the roof of its own building, where a reporter is describing the advance of the Martians and gas coming his way 
and he's overcome. This is the end now. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. A uh, hundred yards away. It's... It's 50 feet. Then again we hear a ham radio operator, 2X2L, calling CQ, I seek you. Is anybody out there? And when he doesn't hear from anyone, and he's interrupted, there's another pause. 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ, New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? 2X. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. In the second half of the drama, Professor Pearson returns. He's roaming around trying to see if anyone else is alive. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road, no traffic. Here in their wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. Push on north. For some reason, I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. Professor Pearson encounters another survivor, but he wants to take over the world. And then he sits in his study, recapping what has happened. Ah, strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record, begun at a deserted farm in Grover's Mill. Strange to watch children... Playing in the streets. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright and clean cut, hard and silent under the dawn of that last great day. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. <laughs> It was simply a dramatization of yet another book, but it was done so well and so believably that a lot of people were scared to death, and it is remembered as the most memorable broadcast in the history of radio. And it was all done live. The music was by Bernard Herrmann, And the words, as I mentioned, were those of Howard Koch, who would later go on to write the movie Casablanca. Have a great Halloween. I'm Dennis Daly.